Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura Grant, Program Assistant at the Jewish Museum of Maryland. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual presentation today, As Above, So Below, Astrology in Jewish Cultural History with Lorelai Kood. Tonight, we are pleased to continue our series of programs inspired by our, our exhibit, Jews in Space, Members of the Tribe in Orbit. I'm glad to see many familiar names in the audience and want to welcome those who are joining us for the first time tonight. If you have missed any programs in this series, you can find recordings on our website using the link in chat. Following on last week's presentation with Dr. Jeremy Brown, in which he explored the connections between Jewish thought and science, tonight's program will look at how astrology has been addressed in a variety of Jewish texts. And with that, I would like to welcome our speaker this evening. Lorelai Kood received her master's degree in Jewish studies from Berkeley's Graduate Theological Union, where her thesis laid the found academic foundation for her upcoming book, Astrology, the Big Book of Jewish Astrology. A practicing professional astrologer for 30 plus years, Lorelai writes a syndicated Jewish astro astrology column, Astrology, for the Jerusalem Post, J, the Jewish News of Northern California, the Detroit Jewish News, and Alliance, France's biggest online Jewish publication. Along with maintaining, her, uh, maintaining and growing her private astrological consulting practice, Lorelai also teaches classes, publishes a podcast on Jewish astrology, and is the executive director of the Aquarian Minion, and mother of the Aquarian Minion Yeshiva. Her Jewish astrology website is astrologyu.com. Ms. Kud, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful, warm welcome. I'm so honored and happy to be with all of you today. Big shout out to Marilyn from Berkeley, California. And um, I'm very excited about your exhibit. I wish I could see it in real life and God willing, we'll be able to travel soon and hopefully be able to see it online thoroughly as well of Jews in space. And what a timely exhibit theme, what with Jewish space lasers and all being so popular in the media these days. So I really hope that you're getting the positive attention that you deserve for bringing such an original and wonderful subject to your community and in fact the world because it's all online and can be seen at your wonderful website so thank you so much um i am going to share my screen with you here hold on and hopefully you're able to see my my screen so this is my presentation as above so below and the play here is Yesh Mazali Israel, Astrology in Jewish Cultural History. So this is a play on the Talmudic <clears throat> dictum that says, Ein Mazali Israel, meaning there is no Mazal, meaning constellations for Israel, the people, the nation, Klal Yisrael, the community of Israel. But no, I'm sorry, Yesh, there is Mazal, because there is so much astrology in Jewish cult cultural history and identity, it's completely a contradiction to say Ain, because for sure there is, so yesh, okay? Um, okay, so this is where the whole thing began for me. As I was um, introduced, Laura mentioned that I've been a practicing professional astrologer for 30 plus years, this is true. In very early 2007, I moved to Israel. I lived in Jerusalem and then in Svat and then in Jerusalem, sometimes both. And I was surrounded by a highly religious community who on one hand, when I told them I was an astrologer or I knew about astrology, um, they, I, you can refer to the left-hand picture over here where somebody is protesting against me and saying, Ein Mazali Israel, based on the uh, Shulchan Arach, which is the Code of Jewish Laws admonishment that says one must not inquire of the astrologers and not consult lots. So there was that. 
and question mark, what about this? What about all of the astrological motifs in art and artifacts, household items, ritual objects, and in Jewish texts from antiquity through the modern age? What about that? How can you re reconcile that? What I learned in my studies, because of course I couldn't stand to be told that there is no Mazal, knowing that there was, and at the same time I had many, if not most of my clientele in Israel during the seven years I lived there were Haredim, religious Jews who would come to me and say, yes, I know what they says about astrology, but tell me about my stars. I had an enormous practice there, but of course, ironically, nobody could tell, you know, there's no advertising uh, word of mouth of only because of the prohibition. So how are we to reconcile the gap between the lived realities of which there is so much material evidence and the Jewish legal text? That was what got me started into my deep dive into Jewish astrology. So I learned, I learned in Israel, I learned Kabbalah, I, I learned texts, I learned practices, and I just started researching it um, very intensely. So I wrote my thesis on it, and a lot of my thesis is um, incorporated into this presentation. So of course we have to start at the beginning Astrology has always been a part of the Jewish story since in the beginning, since the very first chapter of Genesis, which describes the appearance of these celestial orbs on the fourth day of creation. And God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So God made the two lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Everybody knows this. And um, this is a picture of the creation of the world on the fourth day from the Warsaw Picture Bible, Italy, mid 16th century. Over here on this side of the screen, you can see the four corners of, the, of, the, of, the, of time, the four tefukot, the turning points of the year, they're blowing the four winds, right? These are the four cardinal uh, points where you see that motif over and over again in the astrological um, pictures and writing. So it's there from the beginning. We know that God made the great lights. <clears throat> beginning in the Torah and then including the prophets, the historical books, the poetical books of the Hebrew Bible, the celestial bodies, all of them, and the, and the powers that they possessed, which are very explicit, they are very unambiguously presented as creations of God, magnificent, powerful creations created to praise their creator and to serve their purpose as portents signifying the orderly succession of times and of seasons. This is a picture of the fourth day of creation in the Sarajevo Haggadah, 1350. So again, God is creating the heavens and the earth, and then he gets around, or she or they get around to um, doing the stars and the sun and the moon. So <clears throat> it's really not a lot of ambiguity in the Tanakh, so to stay, say, regarding the celestial bodies and the sun and the moon. It doesn't present them as independent of the divine will at all. In fact, they're really the most magnificent, lustrous, bright of all the creations to the point where, you know, we we sing about them in, in our shachrit every day, you know. Um, Yotzer Or, the prayer Yotzer Or is all about the, the stars and the sun and the moon and their obedience, running to do their courses and returning exultant because they're so pleased that they've obeyed the creator's will and the planets themselves have qualities about them. They refract, so to speak, energetic refractions, so to speak, of celestial kinds of energy. And, and the ancients really understood that, that the planets were like lenses for, for specific kinds of energy, right? That come through those kind of planetary lenses where Universally, you know, the ancients understood Mars to be um, warlike because the planet was red and Jupiter to be 
uh, a planet that was beneficent um, because of its uh, lustrous largeness. And so all of these planets had their own archetypal understandings of through the ancients. And that of course includes the Israelites. So the Hebrew Bible, it's full of the glory of the celestial creation. So many wonderful verses throughout the Hebrew Bible that discuss um, praising the creation and that the creation itself praises its creator, the divine one, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. All of these beautiful verses that are so poetic, so wonderful um, throughout Psalms, the Tehillim are songs of praise to the God who made these wonderful creations. So this is a picture of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, which you get around to in, of course, um, the book of Kings. And this is a very hard to see picture of this big uh, contest that Elijah had with these prophets, false prophets, who of course were astrologers. So astrology in the Hebrew Bible, a very conservative view of the celestial creation as the greatest of all the obedient servants of God radiating divine power and glory and very unambiguously condemning idolatrous worship of, of the stars as a substitute or an intermediary to God. That's what this picture is all about. On the other hand, it also relates Israel's future offspring to be as numerous the star, as the stars in heavens. There's Joseph's dream of the tribes as stars and the messianic promise of a star out of Jacob spoken by Balaam, the prophet. Um, and the very important part in Bamidbar that describes the Israelite encampment in the desert, which mirrors the Zodiac. So we're going to look at that. This is from Numbers chapter 2, Parshat Bamidbar. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, the Israelites shall camp each with his standard under the banner of their tribes. They're going to camp around the tent of meeting. That's, of course, the Mishkan at a distance. Now, how is it described? It's always the same encampment, always the same. It's always Yehuda to the east and Ephraim to the west and Dan to the north, and Reuven to the south, and all of the other tribes arrayed around them in the exact same array as the zodiac is arrayed around the ecliptic that is the imaginary belt line that comes out from the earth that the 12 signs of the zodiac are on in a 360 degree circle with 30 degrees in each sign. That is what the zodiac is. The zodiac above is exactly the same configura configuration as the 12 tribes below. And the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is right in the middle, like the sun is in the middle, right? And the Leviim, the Levitical families, who are not encamped in their array around the zodiac, but inside next to the tabernacle are <clears throat> a, a are the inner levy aim, you could say. It's a psychological portrait. What it is, it's a psycho-spiritual portrait of the 12 tribes and the, of Israel and the 12 zodiac signs. But think about this, the Israelites encamp this way 42 times over their 40 year journey through the desert. They never varied. Dan never said, oh, let me try to be in the South, Reuben. I'm sick of being in the North. You go in the South. No, that never happened. It, they encamp that way 42 times over and over. And each time they encamp that way, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. They had the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire. They had this divine presence with them at, in their encampment. And it was like an astral magical, um, astral magical moment, I guess you could say in time, but it was a power grid. It was a nuclear, a spiritual nuclear power grid. It's our sacred Mandela. It is an outline of our sacred Mandela. That's what this picture is. Okay. So the celestial sphere, which is the ecliptic of the zodiac over here is, is 
is part of our heritage. We see it in our own text. This is from the Nachalat Yaakov, which was a <clears throat> treatise on, Ra on Rashi's commentary on the Torah from Poland in 1539. So that's where that illustration comes from. You can see the idea of what we were just looking at before. The ecliptic that goes around the earth, that's the zodiac, right? And this is a flattened version of the zodiac. As it appears in the Oppenheim Machsor, um, let's talk about uh, the rabbis of the Talmud. So we have the biblical literature, so to speak, which we just talked about, the Tanakh, Torah, prophets, writings, Ketuvim, the poetical books. Now we come to the Talmudic era, the rabbis of the Talmud, they literally studied and taught astrology, okay? In the Talmud, it says, he who knows how to calculate the cycles and the planetary courses, but does not of him, the scripture says, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither have they considered the operation of his hands. How do we know it's one's duty to calculate the cycles and planetary courses? Because it is written, for this is your wisdom and understanding, in the sight of the peoples. What wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples? Say it is the science of cycles and planets. One who knows how to calculate astronomical seasons and constellations and does not do so, one may not speak to him. This is so important that you have to literally put the guy into harem and, and, and forbid him from having fellowship you're not, you're not allowed to have kiddush with this guy because he won't, he knows how to do it, but he won't. That's how important it is, okay? Also, the rabbis completely understood and believed in the efficacy of the celestial powers. There's long, long uh, passage in, in Shabbat 156a that gives a complete description of the kind of personality types you'll find of people who are born under the constellation, different constellations. If you're born under a sign that is ruled by Mercury, you're, which would be if you have Virgo rising or Gemini rising, Mercury will be of a retentive memory and wise. Why? Because Mercury is the sun's scribe. Um, it, it talks about he who is born under Mars will be a shedder of blood. Rob Ashi observed, either a surgeon or a thief or a slaughterer or a circumciser. This is people who have either Aries or Scorpio rising because in, of course, we're talking about classical astrology right now, not modern astrology. Modern astrology, um, the, you know, Uranus was not discovered until 1741. And um, so prior to that, for all time, they thought that there were only the planets out to Saturn. So the seven classical astrological planetary rulers are what we're talking about here. So in the Talmud, in many, many places, they talk about astrology because they understand the, uh, they understand the symbols and archetypes of astrology, all of astrology as relevant to their life. They really agreed a hundred percent and were unambiguous about um, whether or not it was a religious obligation to understand the celestial creation, to be able to calculate the calendar and to know when it was going to be Passover and all the other important things. So um, they really frame it as celestial knowledge being a, a particular possession of the Jewish people. Okay. And it's their heritage. It's their nachala. It's the act of taking up their heritage and displaying mastery of it will make the surrounding peoples, the peoples admire the Jewish people for their ownership of the subject itself. Okay. So picture of the Sefer Avra note, which is a book of intercalcations, which is a book that explains how to figure out the calendar and the rather complex mathematical um, calculations that have to have to be done to know when, when is when, this is from 1722. Of course, it's completely decorated with astrological motifs. Rab Rabbinic Judaism valued celestial knowledge. Um, this is a very cute little part of the Talmud where he's talking about what he called the least learned of Rabbi Hillel's students knew all these things. The Mishnah, the Gemara, Halacha, Agada, details of the Torah, blah, 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 blah. 
and here calendrical computations is that is tefu code, which is knowing when the four um, season changes happen during the year, which are the tefu code, which are connected to Nisan, Tishrei, and um, Tevet, and Tammuz. So they were so important that they were in the same category as knowing all these other super important things that you learn in the Beit Midrash. This is a zodiac signs and planets in the Hebrew calendar from Warsaw, 1887, over here on the left side of the page. And interestingly, I, I'm just going to go over this very quickly. The rabbinic literature s speculates scientifically about the heavens, how big they are. The world is 6,000 parsing. So Rabba starts off describing this whole, this is just in Dafyomi, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago in Pesachim 94a and b, there's a whole machlokot about how big is the universe? How big is the world? Then how big is the, is the skies above it? How big are the heavens? And they give amazing calculations that are not so far off in some ways. Um, they talk about, uh, the whole world of the inhabited world is situated under one star. That's the north in, in the northern hemisphere. Um, the Ursa Major, which is called the Wayne or the Wagon, but it's the Big Bear. And then the Scorpio in the south. Well, how do they even know that since they were in the northern hemisphere, right? right? So this is a compilation of a couple of different Midrashim. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that the, the rabbis spent a lot of time talking about astrology and astronomy, which were indistinguishable and completely thought of as one and the same thing up until the early modern era. Okay, so there was no difference whatsoever between astrology and astronomy. They were considered the same science and art. Okay, um, this is a picture of Nimrod building the Tower of Babel to go and the stars in the sky to try to penetrate the heavens they give a long explanation of how they know how big the universe is by this whole verse in, um, I guess it's in Isaiah, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar is being, um, oh, it's referring to a, it's referring to a verse in, in Isaiah that's later attributed to Nebuchadnezzar about, I will send above, ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high and so of course he got he he was referred to nimrod his predecessor and and so through this through this whole thing they're complicatedly decide that they are not so far off about 120 million million miles <laughs> of the size of the universe so you know they did all this without calculators you have to give it to them right uh they speculated on whether or not the um the circle of the earth is fixed and the mazalot, which are the stars revolved. They were trying to understand the difference between the wandering stars and the fixed planets. And they basically brought it home to a lot of homiletical sayings so that you could understand really what was important to them was to understand the quality of time at the different seasons of the year. So the rabbis were ambivalent and creative in their approach to astrology because of, of course also astrology was used for magic. So you can't have it both ways, or can you? Well, you can if you're the rabbis of the Talmud and their, um, their later incarnations in like the, the yeshivas of medieval Ashkenaz, which taught astrology as a subject. So how did they deal with astrology being a subject matter that came from, um, you know, pre-Israelite roots? Because of course, Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans were the astrologers. Everybody knows that astrology as a science, an art, a science, a practice, a language of symbolic symbols and archetypes existed way before Abraham ever came on the scene. And in fact, he had a, had a smackdown, so to speak, with Nimrod in his day. And, um, you know, at the same time, Abraham's the father of astrology in our traditions. So that's... Um, one of the ambivalent and things about our relationship to that idea. But anyway, we use, we use the, we use the information about astrology. We bring it into the bait midrash. We discuss it. We learn it. We learn it to, we do it to learn it and to, we practice to know how to teach it. 
Um, the rabbis didn't deny that the stars had a power effect on humanity at, while at the same time portraying the devout of Israel as being above heavenly influence. So there's all those passages that, you know, talk about there's no mazel to Israel. You know, the, the, if you're a tzaddik, if you're the highest kind of Jew, if you are perfect in every way, it won't affect you. And then they use all these, these examples of these tzaddikim who are affected by astrology, like to prove their point. So it's just very interesting the way that it's used, but it's very, very, very enmeshed in Talmudic literature, okay? Um, of course, astrology in the Jewish mystical tradition, so much to say about that, which I'm really going to skip over. Not a lot that I want to talk about here, except for the Sefer Yetzirah, because astrology in the Jewish mystical tradition is by itself another entire hour. So I'm going to just focus, keeping it um, kind of focused and talk about astrology in the Sefer Yetzirah, which of course everybody knows is the astrological cookbook and Judaism's foundational mystical text which displays absolutely no awareness whatsoever of the Hellenistic ast astrological system, which suggests an earlier dating. And it differs with the planetary order of the prevailing non-Jewish culture. So it has no relationship with the um, Ptolemy's Terra Biblios or any of the, the uh, texts that were cur currently available in um, you know, second century world onward. And um, there's a great orality to the text and stuff. And there are no Talmudic or rabbinic sources in it whatsoever. It's an original work. It's secure, it's self-contained, and it has its own sense of identity. So this is my little chart about the Sefer Yetzirah. Everything you want to know about the astrology and the Sefer Yetzirah is right on this page. Um, the planets, each of the planets has a day of the week that it is re related to that it rules over an aperture in the human head that it rules and a letter that what created it so the letter bet created the planet saturn the day of the week the sabbath day and rules the mouth and then you have all 12 constellations the month the organ and the letter right so if so saturn is this the planetary ruler of Capricorn. Capricorn was created by the letter Ion, which created the Tevet in the year. Capricorn in the Zodiac rules over the left hand. Its planetary ruler is Saturn, which was created by the letter Bet, which rules the day of the week of the Sabbath day and the aperture of the head, which is the mouth. All of this is in a visual form over here. And so the Sefer Yetzi Ross spans several chapters explaining that in a beautiful and poetic way. And if any of you have the opportunity to um, get Rabbi Jill Hammer's book on the Sefer Yetzi Ra, it's wonderful and I highly recommend it. So one thing that as an astrologer really caught my eye in the Sefer Yetzi Ra was the idea of the dragon or the Tali. Um, which is uh, mentioned in one of the verses of the Sefer Yitzhak. It says, the dragon in the universe is like a king upon his throne. The celestial sphere in the year is like a king in a province going throughout his province. And the heart in mankind is like a king at war. The tali, the dragon or hook, is a reference to the eclipse cycles and the relationship to the north and south lunar nodes. So what is this? This is a bunch of pages in a book that I have in my house that I put together and photographed. These are the, the eclipses of the sun between 2001 and 2020, and then 2021 and 2040. So I put them all together. This I'd like to put over here. So you can see, what does it look like? Do you see these wavy blue lines in this picture? These are DNA strands. These are, this is a bigger picture of it down here eclipses going, the eclipse cycles going throughout the world. This is the dragon. This is the dragon in the universe. This is the Tali. This is the north and south lunar nodes. And in Jewish astrology, this is very, very important. Of course, the lunar node, um, there's a north and a south node. And the way it's calculated has to do with the ecliptic. That is, of course, the invisible and imaginary line around the uh, equator area of the earth. Of course, the earth is tilted on its axis. 
and the north and the south lunar nodes in 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 uh, in Eastern astrology, they're called Rehu and Ketu. Okay, they take about 19 months to go 18 and a half, 19 months to go around a sign. They move backwards through a sign. Okay. And this is the depiction of the 19 year metonic cycle on a wheel. The Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar is synced to the 19 year metonic cycle, which is synced to the lunar nodes, which is why the dragon, the nodes in the universe is like a king upon his throne. It is the rulership of time. It's the God of time, so to speak. So let's talk about eclipses really quick. Lunar nodes are related to the eclipses. Bottom line here, and I see that it's already 433, and I'm only on page, I don't know what, of my billion pages that I want to go through. So I'll try to go a little fast. Eclipses are bad for the Jews <laughs> in either case, solar or lunar. This is from the Talmud, right? Because it says, when the sun is in eclipse, it's a bad omen for the whole world, okay? Because it's like what happens um, when, um, well, where am I here? Okay, so the generally, so generally it's just bad for the Jews because the solar eclipse is bad for the non-Jewish nations, but good for Israel. But if something's good for us and bad for them, we get punished. That's the bottom line of that. And of course, a lunar eclipse is bad for Israel and good for the world. So it's bad, bad for us. It's lose, lose either way for us by an eclipse. Okay. Um, and that's, of course, the Talmudic view. That isn't actually what happens in real life, but that's certainly how it was thought of in the, by the Talmudists. Okay. And of course, the apocalyptic or messianic celestial portents and eclipses in the heavens in the Hebrew Bible, there are many, many quotations. I'm not going to read any of them here, but you can see them on this presentation that there are many references to eclipses in the Bible in terms of apocalyptic thought. All these things are going to happen like the day is going to turn into night. Okay. The moon is going to turn into blood. You've seen all these millions of posts on Facebook. So, oh my God, it's a blood moon and a lunar eclipse on Sukkot and blah, blah, blah. Of course, all of our, you know, look at our holidays they are full moon holidays. A lunar eclipse can only happen on a full moon. So over a course of time, there's always going to be eclipses that fall on Passover or on um, Sukkot, which is the opposite full moon holiday across the Jewish year from Passover, or on Tu Ba'av or Tu Bishvat or on Purim. Those are all of our full moon holidays on the Jewish calendar or solar eclipse on the new moon. Okay, so there's always going to be a problem for us in some way or another or so they thought. So what I love, if I could go back in time and take lots of penicillin with me, I would go <laughs> to the medieval era, astrology's golden age in Judaism. And I would go hook up with Avraham Bar Hia and, and for sure Abraham Ibn Ezra, because they are my guys there in the uh, medieval era. Astrology and astronomy were still undifferentiated Knowledge of the celestial creation was considered to be a science at that point. Astrology and the calendar were completely in sync with each other. There was so much astrology going on constantly that eventually the Rambam had to come out against it. And he still couldn't get rid of it because he had to allow the use of segulot, of amulets for healing, which were made according to astrology. So you can't win either way. You can't fight City Hall, Rambam. Whoever's going to ask me about the Rambam, I've just answered you, but I'm happy to go into it more. Um, there was a lot of messianic astrology predicting the end of days and the coming of the Messiah during the medieval era. <clears throat> Avraham Barhia was the one who brought the Jupiter-Saturn cycle, which is messianic predictions um, for the conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. We just had one in December 21st, 2020. Jupiter and Saturn were conjunct in the sign of Aquarius, for the first time since the year 1405. Welcome to the age of Aquarius, people. And of course, the medieval era was also famous for astral magical techniques in medicine, amulet making, and astral magical understandings of the Torah, which are Tame HaMitzvot, right? Uh, Tame HaMitzvot is like, what are the reasons we're doing these mitzvahs? Explanations of the mitzvahs. There were many astral magical commentators, Torah commentators, who 
who wrote about their understandings through an astromagical lens, um, specifically things like Ibn Ezra's view of the golden ca calf as a classical example, and the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, which we just read about in the Parsha not too long ago. And of course, astrology as a subject being taught in the yeshivas of medieval Ashkenaz. This is the zodiac signs encircling the names of the planets here in this picture. So astrological medical melothesia, it's called, this is a zodiac man, body parts associated with the planets and the constellations. There are many zodiac man, um, you know, portrayals in medical manuals, but this is a specifically a Jewish one because he's circumcised there. So this was from a Jewish medical manual. And you see that each one of the zodiac signs is associated with, with one of the body parts. And that's how you know how to um, heal someone. You have to know what body part is associated with what planet and you make an amulet that has the symbols and, of the planet on it and you put it onto that body part at the right time of the day or night that has to do with when that planet is in alignment with the person. So it's complicated, it takes calculations, that's why you need an astrologer. Um, and this is the signs of the zodiac in the Hebrew medical text from Germany in 1480. So this is, of course, we go back to the part in the original um, beginning of my talk, which is, you know, ultra-Orthodox people telling me that we don't have anything to do with astrology. Well, I don't think that anybody living, any Jews, Jewish communities in Germany, 1480, were quote unquote, what you'd call Orthodox now, meaning that they're, they were observant communities of Jews living together. And there you have astrology in their medical manuals telling them about the science and it was used to perform healing. And this is a amulet for protection and healing also from Germany. Um, and of course it has all of the signs of the zodiac there. In liturgical poetry, Keter Malchut, which is still sung on Yom Kippur in Sephardic synagogues, has long passages all about the zodiac. The whole poem of Keter Malchut, there's so many sections that are devoted specifically to the different, all of the different planets and the zodiac itself. And there's astronomical and astrological material in this song. And it's still sung in synagogues, Sephardic synagogues today on Yom Kippur. And I'm not going to sing it because I don't know the tune, but I would, would like to hear a recording of it. Um, just a brief word about astrology in the modern era, the Zohar and beyond the modern era starts pretty much like in, you know, the expulsion from Spain, so to speak, um, is one of the things that, that heralded the modern era. And then, you know, the sciences being on the ascendant. So um, the Zohar and the writings of the Zoharic material, um, it was a conservative view of astrology. It kind of harkened back to more of like, I would say a biblical view of astrology, kind of circumvented the Talmudic train of thought because what they were trying to do was to attempt to overlay the planets on the sphero. So because there were seven planets and seven sphero, there were associations of the Everybody, you know, assist, everybody who makes a system wants to, to match and line up, but it doesn't always work out that way. So by and large in the Zohar itself, in terms of the functions and the spiritual qualities of the planets, they're kind of subsumed into the um, Sephrotic system. And then we have the B'nai Yisachar written in 1840, which compiled all the existing astrological knowledge, at least the Hasidish um astrological knowledge and presented it in a Hasidic and Lurianic kind of a way. So here we have art and in art, art, I'm sorry, astrology and art, architecture and ephemera. This is a fantastic zodiac themed synagogue ceiling um, in Poland that is filled with gorgeous zodiac art all around the edges here are the, are the 12 tribes and the 12 zodiac signs together. This is from the mid 16th to 17th century. It took like 
a little while to build them. We've got Torah themed sacred objects like Torah crowns, household items like calendars, swaddling bands, crazy amount of stuff. If, if it's so unholy, why are there zodiac signs all over these astrologically themed ketubot? A ketubah is a marriage contract. It is delivered under the chuppah, the holiest place where a man and woman come together. A man says to a woman, I take you to my wife as accordance with the law of Moses, the Torah of Israel. And here we, so here's your ketubah and there are zodiac signs all over it. So tell me again how we don't have anything to do with astrology. Oh, here's some astrologically themed Torah crowns. We've got signs of the zodiac on the Torah crown over here on this one from 1772. This is from 18th century Ukraine. You don't get much holier than that, right? Of course, we get, have zodiac themes on religious texts, prayer books, megillas, machsors, um, kiddush levanah. And the 12 signs of the zodiac are portrayed in many, many um, pieces of art from synagogue floors to machsors to say forever note, of course, this is a belt buckle on a, on, on a not a belt buckle, a Torah crown. Um, this is a wimple, which is a circumcision cloth that was all sewn together um, with all the cloths, circumcision cloths of the community to make Torah covers. And it has, they're embroidered with Zodiac signs of their newborn baby boy. So-and-so was born and he was born under the sign of Arie the lion. Um, this is from a, from a synagogue wall, Virgo. We've got every kind of possible example of art of all 12 of the Zodiac signs um, that you can see. I'm gonna just go through this really quickly because I know it's 445 and I know that Trillion wants to take Q and A. So let me just, wind up here and tell you that some of the symbolism is changed and changing throughout the times about how it's being portrayed. And um, if it's so forbidden and we still know that there's so much of it, how do we explain that? I take my cue from Chaim Soloveitchik's work, Rupture and Reconstruction, where he <clears throat> says that um, the reason why we don't know what Jewish life was like before the Holocaust is because during the Holocaust, most all the communal memory went up in smoke, literally like 90 something percent of all European Jews were killed. And there was that we lost our, com our mimetic communal norms. What was normal for us before we didn't know about it. So we only knew about the text afterwards. Afterwards, we couldn't come to each other and say, do you remember how to keep kosher? How did I know how to keep kosher? Oh, because I learned from my mother in her kitchen. How did she learn from her mother in her kitchen and back and so on and so forth? You get to the other side of World War II, you want to keep kosher, you got to look in a book. Nobody's going to teach you how, who did it the way that they did it normally in communal, in communal living throughout all these Jewish communities all over the world. So my, my theory is that astrology got um, sidelined in that way of like, oh, it just says here in these couple of places we're not supposed to um, deal with astrologers uh, because it says so in the book, but it doesn't take into account all the other evidence um, for uh, the relevance of astrology. So thank you so much, uh, Laura. Like, that was just an amazing presentation packed with so much information. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, you did just an amazing job. And um, so as a reminder to everyone that's joining us on Zoom today, if you can please use that Q&A function that you can see at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. I know we've got a couple in already and we'll do our best to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, for those of you joining us on Facebook today, if you can please submit your questions using the uh, comment section and Laura, who we saw at the start of the program, will get them over to, to us. So starting with uh, what we have in the Q&A already, and I think you sort of touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about the extent of there being a Hellenistic influence on um, 
Jewish approaches to astrology. Right, of course, like the Hellenistic influence, you know, it's interesting because the Hellenistic influence was definitely there. Now, remember, like there, we're talking about East, there's Eastern astrology, which is uh, Vedic astrology, and there's Western astrology, which is Hellenistic astrology. Of course, there's also Chinese astrology, which is a system that isn't um, under discussion here and probably wasn't too, uh, too much on the Jewish radar in antiquity, although it existed um, probably for a long time before our astrology, I'm going to guess, or at least concurrent. Um, so there's in, in the sense that Jewish astrology is Western, quote unquote, the same as Hellenistic. Yes, it uses that the same system as the Hellenistic system. Um, it incorporates certain parts of Hellenistic astrology, um, but it also has what I'm going to call market differentiators. Like it's the, the rabbis of the Talmud did a really good job of in their analytics of astrology, of putting in differentiators between the way that we think of astrology and the way that um, the nation, quote unquote, nations of this world think about it. And specifically, even when you look at the Sefer Yetzirah, it has, there's definite differences between the Hellenistic systems of um, planetary associations of days of the week and all of that. Um, and the um, Hebrew system. So it's a, it's a, I'm going to say ambivalent relationship. We certainly drew from it. There's a lot of, there's a ton of overlap, but we have our own original take on it. I hope that's a good answer. I wanted to look in the um, chat because there was something I specifically wanted to answer. Hold on a second. Sure. Wait. Um, Some of the chat uh, questions have okay. popped in. So yeah, lunar eclipse on a full moon, solar eclipse on a on a new moon. That's how it works. It's called science. Um, okay, somebody, Rainy Logan asked about this witch safer <laughs> Yetzi Ra. I just want to say that when I did my thesis, I used the A. Peter Hyman um, critical edition that took all three of the long, short, and Saja recensions of the Safer Yetzi Ra, and that's what I did my research on. Okay, so I hold by, my favorite one is the long recension, which was by Shabtai Danalo, who was my favorite um, astrologer, and who was one of the, uh, he was, you all probably know that there are many versions of the Sefer Yetzirah, okay, but the one that we see most of the time is the Gra version. That's the version that um, R.A. Kaplan used, and it's probably the most popular version, but there are other versions that are earlier versions. There's critical, there's a critical works on it, which is, are important to read, but I'm a big fan of Shabtai Danolo because he was like Mr. Astrology. He really emphasized all of the um, astro much more so than any of the other of the three recensions and the gra draws on Shatai Danolo quite a bit so that is the answer to that question I know it's obscure and weird but it's important um so I think we've got a lot of questions yeah. leaning into sort of people wanting to know a bit more about you and then I think layering into that as well like specifically what the work is that you do and perhaps how they can go about having their own Jewish readings. I think that covers about four of the questions that we have in Q&A. So no, maybe you I, can- uh, I, I, What do I do? I do like a million different things, but in terms of astrology, like I said, I've been a practicing professional astrologer. I have a website, astrologew.com, as in Jew, okay? Also, I have a, a Facebook page for astrology and you can follow me on Facebook can be in touch with me at my email address, laurelaikud at yahoo.com, which hopefully someone will put into the chat for me. Yep, we'll work um, on it. And I do work with, I've been working with people for a million years. So, you know, 30 years already is a million years to me. So yes, I, I take private clients. Um, and um, of course, a person would have to have their date, time, and place of birth for me to be able to do a natal chart reading. I write a astrology column for um, the Jerusalem Post, which is syndicated in several Jewish newspapers in America, J the Jewish Weekly of Northern California. I'm sorry, it's now called the J the Jewish News of Northern California. 
what is it called the weekly when it was first published like 150 years ago the detroit jewish news um and i think that i'm about to hook up with the st louis jewish um hope it's called the Jewish star. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Well, um, and I teach classes. I think if you want to learn deep more deeply, you can go to my YouTube page where I have all 12 of my hour long lectures on all 12 of the zodiac signs and the tribes and the months that they're related to. Just look up Lorelei Kud astrology on YouTube and you'll find it. Um, there's a whole playlist because I've done that um, over the last 12 months. I'm also in my spare time, I'm out, which is like, I don't have any spare time. So a lot of the time I am also the executive director of the Aquarian Minion, which is a 46 year old Jewish renewal congregation in Berkeley, California. You can find us at aquarianminion.org. And um, of course, when I saw this job, I was like, well, Aquarian, I have to go. I'm not an Aquarius, but my Venus is an Aquarius and Venus is my planetary ruler because I have a Libra rising. And the principle is that the planetary ruler of your rising sign is your charts ruler. And that is proven out in the Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 156a, in this long argument that the rabbis have about what is more influential, the sun the sun sign, your sun sign or your rising sign, they come down on the side of on the side of the rising sign, the ascendant. They were all about the ascendant people. Um, what else do I want to say? Because we only have a couple of more minutes. Well, can um, I, I? Yeah, go ahead. Can I, ask, can I pull a couple of questions from our Q and A list to ask sure. you? And um, so, uh, hold on. One really quick question I saw that's on there, and I think this might be useful for more than the individual that asked it. We have recorded the program today. We will be putting it up on our website. Should be up by middle of next week, probably. Um, it's that same link we shared right up at the beginning to watch any recordings of our past programs. Great. Uh, so one question I really want to ask you, because I think it plays interestingly to some of the conversations we've already been having with this exhibit, is about imagining a future in which humans, are living beyond the earth and that there are Jewish communities beyond the earth, how will a Jewish individual born on another planet work out what their star sign is? Well, they won't because it won't even have anything to do with them because they won't be on earth. This all is around the ecliptic, the imaginary ecliptic that goes around the earth is, is the zodiac of planet earth. It's very closely associated with earth. Back in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The zodiac, as we understand it Jewishly, has to do with our life on earth. So in the future, when Jews are living in outer space, there might be a new kind of astrology where the the um, the that where it's calculated according to the position of the planet that it's on. But if it's in, well, if it's in our solar system. I mean, it's a solar, it, it's still the sun. The sun is still the center of our solar system, but I don't see us going and living so much on other planets unless we might be hanging out in, on the moon. I don't know about people being born on the moon though. So I don't know what other planets in our solar system would be um, good for giving birth. Although I keep wondering if a female astronaut gave birth in the space uh, station as, as it's orbiting. How would that all work out? Like, how would I even do that baby's chart? I don't know. <laughs> that's, new that's, software. that's the answer. Someone's going to have to invent new software for that. That's fascinating. We've, we've, thought, we've thought, we've talked a lot about how to be observant when you're off of the earth. But so this is sort of, I think, taking us to that next level. But um, Well, did you, I'm sure you talked about like, how to cal calculate when it's Shabbos in space and stuff like that. Right? Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations around that subject, which if there's anyone new in the audience that hasn't uh, joined us for one of those, have a little look on the website. It's, it's come up a few times. Um, okay, let's see if we can squeeze in one more question. What about this one? Um, would each of the 12 tribes have the characteristics of the zodiac that they represent, such as Yehuda, Aries, 
being an initiator warrior yeah. for all five miles? Wonderful question. And the answer is yes. All 12 of the signs um, that correspond to the layout of the tribes around the Mishkan. So understand there's two, there's two systems. The 12 tribes around the Mishkan, starting with Yehuda, Aries, Issachar, Taurus, Zebulon, Gemini, etc. And then the other um, common motif, which is the 12 tribes, which includes Levi, which is on the on the breastplate, the Hoshan Mishpat of the, the high priest. So that is not the same. Uh, obviously, it's a different, it's a different layout. Some astrological systems, which are incorrect, use that one. This is the is the Kabbalistic system, the RE system. It is the it's the understanding of the of the tribes around the Mishkan and the zodiac as being a, above and below. So yes, the the twelve tribes draw the symbols and archetypes from the twelve the twelve zodiac signs and the twelve tribes understand in the symbolic language that is astrology. Astrology is a language of symbols and archetypes. So if I say to you your Yehuda is really giving you a problem right now. I'm talking about your first house. Your first house is in trouble right now. You've got Ma'adim, Mars, transiting your first house if you have Aries rising, and which is your Yehuda area. So I'm speaking in a language, if you're an observant Jew and you don't know anything about Hellenistic archetypes, I'm speaking in a language that you know and you understand Yehuda. He's impetuous. He's He's, he, he's bold, he's courageous, he comes against Joseph, he stands up for what's right, he admits when he's wrong, when he's made a bad decision, Yehuda and Tamar. So all of the, all of the 12 tribes have their own stories, the Midrashim, the Agadic stories, the Torah, the Talmud, we have so much information on the personalities of the 12 tribes and how much they relate to the 12 zodiac signs in ways that are just absolutely amazing. And I teach a lot about that in my classes as well. So when you're working with those symbols and archetypes, I really encourage you to dig deep into those sources so that you can really get a sense of what's going on with your, with your uh, individual natal chart. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. So I think with that, our time is just about out. Um, as a quick reminder, we've dropped um, a whole bunch of links into the chat there for you where you can read a little bit more about how to connect with Lalai and all of the various pieces that she's got available so you can continue to explore this subject. Um, as a quick reminder also, um, love to invite you to join us again. Um, we have another presentation coming up on April 7th, exploring the science in science fiction. Uh, again, inspired by our current exhibit, uh, Choosing Space, Members of the Tribe in Orbit. We're dropping a link into chat right now for you so you can register for that. Um, Laura, if I can please ask you again to drop the link in so everyone can have a little look at the recordings of the past programs that have been inspired by our exhibit as well. Um, that'll pop up in chat for you in one moment. As a reminder, as you leave the program today, you'll be directed to um, a survey. If you can please take a moment to share your thoughts, it really does help us in our planning process. And then with that, I would just like to say a massive thank you. Thank you to Laura for introducing the program today. Thank you to everyone for joining us, but especially thank you so much, Laura Light, for just such a fascinating presentation. Thank you for having me. It was a huge honor. And thank you everyone who came and hung out with us over this last hour. And thank you, Jewish Museum of Maryland. I'm going to come visit you, God willing. <laughs> yep. When we get back there, come back, come back and visit us. And hopefully everyone in the audience as well, once we're able to... Uh, return to normal we look forward to seeing you all again uh in the future so thank you so much everyone for joining us have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you back in our virtual jmm very soon thank you so much Bye, thank you. Thank you. everybody